You are listening to the Brought to Light Masonic Podcast, a podcast for Freemasons and the public, bringing you to light through discussions and research papers about Australian Freemasonry and the Victorian jurisdiction in particular. <clears throat> All right, let's get started. Well, welcome back to the Brought to Light Masonic Podcast. I'm your host, Brother Jack Aquilino. And I'm your host, brother, David Illingworth. And this is an episode which is obviously going to be discussing a very important topic. And we actually have a very special guest today, someone who I'm very, very excited to have on our podcast. He's a friend of ours, a friend of the podcast. And of course, we're talking about Worshipful Brother Jack Harley. Jack, welcome to the uh, Brought to Light Masonic podcast. It's an honor to be here. It's good to have you on. I mean, I, I know that we all, every week we talk about you and Larry and Jason and the team and we usually, uh, from episode to episode, we throw uh, shots at each other, um, which is all friendly. It's all in, in the in friendly competition. It's all, all good. It's all good. Exactly right. And we love having the idea of having you guys on our show because um, we're, our podcasts are about the same age. Uh, we do have more episodes than you, and we, we, we always like to point that out. Uh, but in saying that's that... That's because you're in the metric. That's because you're in the metric system. Well, so look, that's, we, that's we, excuse. It's, that's it's so excuse. funny. I, I was just about to say it's not because we're on the metric system. <laughs> well, that's the, that's the excuse at least. But it's really good to have you on and we'll get into some more information about who you are for our, some of our listeners who may have been listening for the first time or living on another planet. Um, but thank you for coming on the show. David, this is obviously uh, an exciting time to do podcasting in Australia, especially for me because uh, the studio we're in, which is basically my spare bedroom, is... Not as hot because we're heading into winter, thank God. Uh, so it's a great time to do podcasting. And, and I guess we have to the opportunity now to get into some Masonic news. So let's get into some Masonic news. Brought to light Masonic podcast news. Your news on current affairs and events as they happen in Victoria and around the Masonic world. And about Masonic news, thank God this week we've got very little to report. Um... You know, Freemasons Victoria appears to have been on a quiet sort of run, and it's really good to have no news. David, they say no, no news is good news, so um, I've got not too much, other than obviously the Good Friday appeal. What a great success that was yesterday. I think the um, Uncle Bob's Club raised about $500,000 uh, for the Good Friday appeal at Royal Children's Hospital, and obviously we had a big role in that. I know you were out there with Joe, and it was good to see you out there doing things. Oh, it was fantastic to be able to do it again. It was a, it was a great honour to to be back at the same Seven Eleven, uh, rattling the can, as it were. Um, it wasn't. I must admit, it wasn't as busy as last year, um, but I feel we may have got higher donations because uh, the tins did feel a little bit heavier than I recall them being. Um, but it was really good. The only downside, really, was um, the sun. Is as it got later in the day, the sun turned, and we were just sitting there in the peak sun getting burnt to a crisp well so, freemasons are known for a lot of things but having um you know skinny physique physiques and and tans is not one of them so yes, um, well, us pasty we, we, men were struggling yesterday that's for sure well that's the thing we planned ahead and we brought chairs so next year we're going to plan really far ahead we're going to have a table chairs and an umbrella well, there you go. Well, I think the umbrella is a good idea, and it will obviously uh, match your complexion. Although, Joe, your wonderful fiance, she looked like she was having a great time. She was raising more money than you, maybe because she's nicer. But I'll, I'll leave that open to speculation. I think. No, I think it's that she stacked the deck and brought in a whole bunch of coins from home, uh... and so her, her tin was already very heavy before the day even started. Jeez, there you go. But it was great to be out there in the Victorian community, and I think the Good Friday appeal ended up raising about fifteen million dollars statewide. Um, for our international wow. listeners, I guess um, Good Friday is obviously something we tend to, tend to celebrate across the Western world, but in Victoria particularly, we've got the Royal Children's Hospital. It's a great hospital that looks after sick kids. Um, a lot of people are touched by it, and it's one of the state-of-the-art facilities in the world. The Victorian government, along with the citizens of Victoria, tend to do a bit of an appeal for it. Um, we raise money um, through collections and donations, and every year, it's been going on for a long time now, I think about 75 to 80 years, and, and generally, the record keeps wow. getting broken, and, and this year, it was huge, so it was great to be out there. We had, um, from our lodge, about 17 volunteers. We covered uh, six 7-Elevens for a full-day shift, and I think the Northern District itself raised something like 150 grand, so it was, it was pretty pretty good day. Pretty good day. So it's not too bad, and you, and you had your own mum out there, Jack, by herself, rattling well. the <laughs> 
<laughs> you know, this is the thing. You know, when you call on me to fill spots, I'll fill them with anyone. I have no shame whatsoever. Um, so <laughs> and my sister was supposed to be with her, but she was a bit hungover from the night before. So I guess um, there you go. Sorry, sick kids. Uh, Rachel went out drinking. But ultimately, <laughs> it was a good day. Um, we raised some good money. And, and there's no other Masonic news for me beyond that. What about you, David? Is there anything Masonically happening for you that we need to know about? Uh, not really. I mean, the only things that I'll probably discuss later on in the episode in the shameless plug section. Um, so yeah, I think we're pretty much all good on, on news. Well, that's good. That means we can get straight into our introductions and interview with, of course, our special guest, Worshipful Brother Jack Harley. Jack, like I said, too excited, you know, sort of shaking in my boots, nervous about interviewing such a Masonic scholar <laughs> such as yourself. <laughs> Mate, kneel, you kneel. Uh, I, I, I would kneel if the chair wasn't stopping me, you know. But uh, tell me, uh, Jack. I, I think the thing is, he is kneeling. You, you can never tell, uh, the, you never tell the difference. See, I knew it was going to come around to that. I knew that. I knew that. <laughs> Look, I, I won't, I won't lie. Any man with the name Jack is worth my admiration and respect. But Absolutely. You, you, you've got that above me. But Jack, for our listeners who have for some reason missed the last fifty episodes of the podcast and don't know who you are and the Masonic Light podcast are. Maybe give us an introduction about who you are, where you're from, and how you came to Freemasonry, and we'll just delve down the uh, the rabbit hole of your life story from there. Sure. Uh, let's let's start at the end with the Masonic Light podcast. I um, uh, these are a couple of friends of mine who invited me to be on their show. Um, I think it was around episode eight, um, and I came in and I had fun and I enjoyed it, and I said I need to do this again. So uh, it's kind of like Mike Hambrick. Um, yeah. <laughs> on the TMR, you just, you know, if you hang around long enough, you just eventually sort of glom into it and become a part of it. But uh, uh, it's, uh, for those of you that don't know, it's Masonic Light, L-I-T-E podcast. And uh, we're kind of the, the silly, um, not too serious version of Masonic podcast. And we just get together and have fun. We, we meet interesting people. We just, uh, uh, one of our... Um, uh, lodges sponsored well actually the uh commandery in uh, grand commandery of pennsylvania sponsored a um uh someone a pastor to go to the holy lands um and we had him on as a trip as a um as a guest uh, really interesting hmm. episode um but uh, we do things like that and we just get together and hang out and kind of like you guys do uh, we we're we're usually a little less serious i have to say though um your paper that you read chapter one on or part one um, on um, RJ's podcast um, inspired our last episode. Um, and, and that one's going to get posted on Monday. So look for that. Um, and it's titled uh, exactly where we need to be. That's fantastic. And, and there's just, there's so much talk about we're failing, we're closing, we're losing members, blah, blah, blah. And, and I contend in this episode that we are exactly where we need to be right now. Um, we are moving into what Freemasonry will become next. Exactly right. So anybody interested, tune in for that. Um, as for my Masonic career, I, I'm 15 years in. Um, I ricocheted off a number of Masons in my life that um, uh, never really stuck. Um, and I was at, at dinner one night with uh, some friends, some neighbors. Somehow Freemasonry came up and he said, uh, I said, well, well, how does that happen? And he said, well, it just did. Hmm. So he, hmm. he handed me a petition and, and I went in. Um, I am, and I don't know if you have these in Australia yet. If you do, uh, don't. I came in on a one-day class. Oh, yes, we don't have that monstrosity over here. But... Uh, thank God for you. Um, <laughs> I have heard yeah. how much so many people seem to love them uh, or hate them. I, I, well, I, I do have to ask one question about the one day class. So is it, it's all three degrees. Cause I know your degree ceremonies are slightly different to ours. I mean, here to go from the first to the third, you've literally got to wait 12 months right. before you can do it. So yeah, there, yeah. so they just pump you, th pump everyone through. Like, like you were shot out of a gun. I got, <laughs> I, I got one, two, three, four, seven, 14 and 32 all in one day. Wow. Wow. Yeah. Jeez, you can imagine so how, much wrong with you can that. Imagine how meaningful that experience was to me, right? Yeah, oh, that's horrible. That's horrible. Yeah. I'm so sorry to and, criticize and your and beginning. I could have gone, <laughs> gone all the way to Shrine uh, on the same day, and, and oh. they said, you know, I, I said, no, that's enough for me. But 
Wow. But in, in some respect, that motivated me to take a chair, go through the line, um, and really learn the details that I surely missed, you know, in that kind of environment. It was an audience. Uh, there was, I think, 300 of us in a, in a theater setting, and we watched the degrees being conferred to someone on stage. Wow, so you didn't um, even participate. So didn't even kneel at the altar. Um, wow. Yeah, it was Yeah, it was a different experience, and I'm glad it, they're moving away from that. It was a nice try. I'll give them that. It was a good try. But uh, it, it does make me wonder how long until they do one-day classes to Worshipful Master. So you come in in the morning, you leave as Worshipful Master at night. <laughs> Uh, they, I think, well, I think they would have if they could have. Yeah. We were heading in that direction lodges, here, so. <laughs> a couple of lodges that might need that, but, um, but no, so I, I, I came through, I was, um, Worshipful Master in 2009, and, um, it was a terrific experience for me learning the work, and, but, but when I came in, this was 15 years ago, and I, like, one of the things, we're going to talk about the Holy Saints John, which you guys don't recognize down there, but we'll, We'll explain a little more, but one of the first questions I asked anybody was, "Why St. John? What? 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 What's that?" <laughs> and they said, "The patron saint of stonemasons. Don't worry about it." <laughs> <laughs> like every answer from every past master we have here, except your own. <laughs> yeah. So I, that was, you know, but but that sort of um, turned me on to digging deeper and learning more and finding out other things. And I, I accidentally got on a website that was um, sort of my Rosetta Stone. It was uh, um, Peter Stones. Oh, yes. uh, if you've seen it, freemasons-freemasonry.com. That, that was my lifeboat. I went there anytime I had a question about anything. There was great Masonic information on it. Um, and and that, that sort of fostered the idea that, okay, Yeah, but are you still there, mate? Right? Every bit of it means something more than what he thinks it means. Yep. So that, that's where I started peeling back the onion, and that's kind of where this this discussion about the Saints John comes from. So Interesting. Um, I'm, a, I'm also high priest in my Royal Arch chapter right now. I'm also a member of uh, Scottish Rite in the Northern Masonic Jurisdiction of the U.S., and I am uh, I am second in line at uh, Ubar Grotto, uh, which is uh, another one of the social fraternity side bodies in in the U.S. I don't think you do you have you don't have Grotto. No, we, we don't have we don't have that fun stuff here. Um, you can't smile at Lodge here; it's against the law. Well, <laughs> yeah. you're able to do all the things at regular Lodge that we do at Grotto, so that's brilliant. Really the, the big problem here is if you smile, then all of a sudden you're doing a charge or you're taking office. Or, <laughs> it's or that contract thing, right? We try to do it. We've actually invented, um, you know, like when you're sleeping on a plane, you need those things to block your eyes out, whatever they are. We've got them here now. Um, we're going to get Masonic light emblems inscribed into them. Um, and so, you know. yeah. <laughs> but, yeah, it, Jack, it is a bit Jack like down that. here needs, needs that. Jack, I think... I'm right in saying in every body you're in, and you're basically in all of them, you're ba I'm pretty sure you're in office in every single body you're in, aren't you? Yes, I fell for the trick. Uh, you, <laughs> yeah. yeah. You, you are, yeah. yeah. And, and how, how many bodies are you in? Oh, good question. Um, <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I, I, it, think, I think I'm in seven. Let's have the CD right here now. Come on. <laughs> Okay, well, you can go through them, uh, the, the craft, the mark, the chapter, the um, Royal Arc, uh, the, Royal, the Royal Arch, the uh, Royal and Select, the Operatives, the Scottish Rite, the Societas Rosicruciana in Anglia, the command, Ooh. the Commandery, or the Preceptory, we call it here. So that's nine. Okay. The Operatives, the Master Templar. Yeah. yeah, got those. Yeah, yeah, so nine, I think. I think I'm in nine, but multiple lodges in some of them. In the mark, I'm in two lodges. In the craft, I'm in five. Nice. Um, yeah, so I made so the big mistake. Ever, I made the big mistake, Jack. <laughs> you're up, are you ever home for dinner is the question. Well, but, what, what is dinner at home? I've never heard of this thing. Um, I, <laughs> <laughs> my mum loves it. She saves a lot of money. But, you know, uh, ultimately, I've got a couple of questions for you about that because you, you did this one-day yep. class thing, which is, um, in my view, something that's worth a whole episode. And I know that you guys have talked about it quite a lot on your podcast and Masonic Roundtable have done an episode. It's probably more of a thing in the US. But 
Just so our listeners know, it is the same in Victoria in the sense that a grandmaster can make a mason on site. Uh, generally, the grandmaster has the power to make someone a Freemason just by declaration. Uh, and I guess what the one day class idea was is to get people through Freemasonry without having to go through the clutter of the degrees. And just once they're in, the theory was they'll stick around and stay. Also, it might look good on the books as well because you're getting a lot of fees getting paid as well. So it is interesting in that respect. But you, so you come through this one day class process. Then you felt you said you felt a responsibility to try and actually figure out what the hell it is you're you're doing on that day. You know, try and delve into it into a sense of, well, yeah. now I've done this one day classing. I don't remember a quarter of it. I need to actually figure out what the hell I did. Is that is that the sort of inspiration you had? Because not many people, I from what I hear, get that from the one day class experience. It, it worked that way for me, and I've spoken to other people. I've spoken to people that it works both ways. Some just joined, got the card, we'll never see them again, and some were motivated by that vacuum of information that, you know, I know I was told something, but I don't know what it was or what it mm. meant. Um, for me, it worked that way for other people. It doesn't, but even coming in the long way, you get people who join, get the card and the ring and go away and you never see them again. That's true. So, so what... it works both ways. And the grand lodge of Pennsylvania holds that the retention rate is about the same. Okay. Um, so... I don't, I'm not sure I believe that, but that's what they say. What, one question with that. So you go through the one-day class. I, do you approach a lodge first and then after the class you're at a lodge, or have you then got to go find a lodge? Um, no. Well, in my case, I I had a friend who was in a, the lodge in my town. So I petitioned that lodge, turned the petition in. It was read, voted on. Um, I was examined and all that stuff for what, what do they call it now? Committee of Inquiry. Uh, came and, and had the conversation with me and then I was balloted on and, and approved uh, and scheduled for the one day class. So it, the process, that process is the same. What, what's different is you, you, you don't get prepared. You're never blindfolded. You don't go into the lodge room. Nothing happens to you that happens to the candidate. And that's the part that I said, all right, that's not what happened to my father. Mm. Yeah. That, yeah. that's not, I, I did not walk the same road as many worthy fellows have walked. So I knew that I had to, I knew that I had to go through the chairs. It was just, I didn't believe I could do it because I never thought I could memorize the work, but mm -hmm. um, you know, I, I somehow I managed to get it done. Well, two things following up from that. Did you ever decide to uh, act as a candidate in a demonstration or something? Have you ever gone through it? Um, interesting that you'd ask. Yes. Uh, I did it once at a at a school of instruction. We hold periodic schools of instruction. So that was um, the first time I had ever knelt at the altar was for that. Now, I understand you guys don't actually have an altar that you're mm -hmm. kneeling at in your work. But um, in our work, that's where the uh, uh, where the obligations are taken. And, and, and that's where the, the rubber meets the road, as they say. Yeah, that's it's good. It's good that you at least walk those steps. It's. I mean, I thought that for me, that was one of the most transformative part of, parts about Freemasonry was the uh, walking through the same steps as, you know, greats like Winston Churchill and, and one of our longest serving prime ministers here, Menzies and those sorts of people. And oh, um, it's that that process is transforming. So it's good that you got to do that. But one thing I'm talking, getting back to Masonic Light, which um, obviously, you know, you're a big part of. And I know that you sort of did what David did and stuck around until you got invited to be a host. But um, <laughs> <laughs> you know, yes, well done, it, it works. This is evidence. It works. So if you want to stick, if you want to be a, a host of our podcast, just come on every week. But with um, with um, with Masonic Light, despite the fact that you guys, and you know, I I, I do note that you say you guys are less pretentious and and very and very much fun, which you are. But I have to say, listening to a lot of your episodes or all of them, and and especially the last couple of episodes, you know, there is a serious tone that comes through, and I think that you especially are a big part of that. It's clear you can't help yourself sometimes. You're a bit like me. You have this, you have this passion for Freemasonry, and you really do have an intellectual grasp of it. Um, aside from the fact that you're a fantastic ritualist, everyone's told me you are a brilliant ritualist. You know, aside from that, uh, you were <laughs> until until you got a Masonic light. <laughs> well, I, Jack, I think the big difference. Uh, with Masonic Light and ours, is they have a comic relief. They have Larry as yeah, the token true. Australian who's the comic relief. <laughs> we we don't really have a Larry. We, we need a Larry. I'm, sh I'm sure there's a Larry in Australia somewhere. 
We'll find him. Uh, it's going to teach him how to use a computer. That's our new hard part. Maybe not. He would emigrate if you gave him if you gave him half of a ham sandwich. He would emigrate to Australia. <laughs> <laughs> I'll put that on the books. Actually, we can afford that, can't we, David? I'll figure that out. But <laughs> I think so. But I must admit, we don't. The Masonic Lights didn't have a far bigger budget than we do. They have their own T-shirts. Where's our T-shirts, Jack? Yeah, yeah, just... that right there. Shirt right there. Go ahead. <laughs> I have to order one of those. I mean, but I think but... it's official. But tell me, Jack, you know, because you clearly do have this, you know, you are actually intellectually you know, on top of the, the craft and, you, and you're obviously a great mentor. This is partly why I invite you on, because you started talking about on the last episode of Masonic Light um, was you're talking about the fact that you do this lecture on, on you know, the, uh, the, the patron saints of St. John and these sorts of things. And so you must you must uh, really get a kick out of it. How much um, time do you dedicate to researching Masonic uh, sort of information and history and, and symbolism and and how much of an impact do you think that's had on your life that sort of stuff um i'm really sure that my boss is not listening to this <laughs> so i would say that i spent more time doing it than i probably should so yeah. let's just leave it at that because <laughs> um, i'll get like shiny penny syndrome and i'll go wander down into the interwebs and find something cool. But I, 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 I've done this over a lot of years. And for the last several years, I've been the person at my lodge teaching the candidates. We, we got confused a little bit. We called it mentoring, but it's not really mentoring. Mentoring is more of a one-on-one -on -one friendship kind of, mm. hey, let's go get, you know, let's go to the ball game. Let's let me, I'll pick you up and bring you to lodge. That, to me, that's mentoring. Mm, mm. What I did was was more Masonic education. And I, I all right, the slipper. What, what what about that slipper? Why is that important in in the ritual work? Where did it come from? Um, what does that tell us? How should we consider that? Those kinds of things. Um, so I actually came, went through and outlined the entire ritual process, all three degrees, and I broke it out step by step. And and it was astounding how much was in there that we just, you know, skip like a stone over the top of the water and we yeah. never really get down into what it, what it probably meant to the guys who wrote the work, because we have to, we have to remember that this was all composed sometime after 1700 when it was all logged in. And yes, it reflects back on that operative masonry stuff, um, but the guys that were writing this were um, were extreme intellects. I mean, these mm. are guys who read the Bible in Hebrew and Greek, um, and they knew the stories. They knew all the myths and the legends, and they knew how they all came together. They were some of them were um, were alchemists and proto scientists, the Isaac Newtons and Christopher Wren, and and and, and all of those people who really built the world that we're in now. Hmm. Um, those are the people who wrote the work, um, them and their, they and their friends are the people who wrote this ritual work that we have now. Um, so you have to try to put yourself in their mindset. And, and we're going to talk in a little bit about, as we talk about the Saints John about, uh, hermeticism and, and duality because they were hermeticists. They were, they were studying the world and how things work on that level. Uh, they were Kabbalists. Um, they were studying the Kabbalah and they were studying the Kabbalah in original Hebrew because mm. they, they learned it. They had it. They knew it. So there is more there for the person who wants it. Yeah. The person that just wants to be a part of a fellowship and a men's group and you want to go raise money for the kids. Um, that's great. Mm. You don't you don't have to go to this level, but you should understand that it's there. Yeah. And that ever in your life you need that stuff um you can find it it's there and there are people who know it and will share it with you and that's that's i think part of it i think i think you're a great example of someone that actually utilized the you know in, in our first degree the tools of the 24 inch gauge the common gavel and the and the chisel and the idea is you meant to use the common gavel, the force of conscience, to chisel away your perpetual rough, rough ashlar to try and reach that, you know, that concept of perfection, that perfect ashlar. And I think that what you're saying is there is more there. there there's that there's that deep element of symbolism and esotericism and all these sorts of things that run through the intellect of Freemasonry. Because really, like you said, and you're adopting what's called an originalist approach to interpretation, which is what we use in the law and it's, it's this idea of interpreting the document through the prism of those who wrote it, right? And that's I think that's mm -hmm. a very smart way of doing it. 
um, because what we're doing is we're looking at Masonic ritual that perpetuates through time. Its values are relevant through time, exactly. but we're looking at it through the prism of the people who set that set that that process up, and that's so so important. And um, I have to say, it's, it's I'm just I'm looking at your shirt and saying, oh, this is a Masonic Light podcast host that I'm talking to, having an intellectual conversation with. It's amazing. <laughs> but, but, no, you, you know, know, but you know, take a deep breath. You'll be okay. I'll get through it eventually, but you you know what I mean. So, so, but you, you did say something which was great. You said, uh, and I've written this down, so I might steal it from you. Yes, you know, skipping um, skipping the rock over the surface of of you know the water of what Freemasonry is. This sort of concept of there's so much below, and I think that one of the things that we're missing here in Victoria is a sense of a purpose of education, um, an idea of you know people actually learning about what it is that the free, Freemasonry is, and it doesn't necessarily have to be you know, deep symbolic Kabbalistic messages that it can be interpreted through, you know, an architectural analysis of, you know, whatever it is, symbols and the rest. But it can be something as simple as just getting people in a room and talking about the practical application of free Masonic principles in today's society. I mean, we live in a chaotic time in, in, in history, a wonderful and, time. And that's exactly what the, the podcast world is doing right now. Mm. Your podcast, ours, TMR, uh, you know, all of, all of those little groups are putting this out there where that wasn't happening 15 years ago. Exactly Everybody, right. you went to lodge, you heard the minutes, there might be a presentation, you eat pie and go home. Yep. And that was it. And, yep. and the first 10 years of my masonry, that's what it looked like. And since then, I'm seeing this, this shift toward more learning, more understanding. Um, the, there's a Pennsylvania Lodge of Research, the, the Academy of Masonic Knowledge that you've heard about. Um, the, 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 you know, just all of the offerings that are out there for education now and the younger guys that are coming in and, and I know blue lounge is very focused or not focused, but very, very interested in, um, engaging the younger Masons as, as they join. And I think they're looking for this mm -hmm. stuff and we have to position ourselves to deliver it. And no, if I we agree. don't, we will have, we will have missed two or three generations and that, well, that would be an awful shame. well that's the thing i mean i look at, at our lodge um, our main mother lodge brunswick united and the biggest issue that we're having at the moment I mean, it's a, it's a good and a bad thing is last year we spent most of the year just doing degree work so first second third first second third basically almost every month and a lot of the guys were getting a bit over it but it's one of those things that, while, while that's important i do wish that there was a little bit more like education in there. Like I'd love someone to come in and do a deep dive or just have a general chat about some of the esoteric things from Freemasonry, just to make me think, even if it's a brief outlier, which I can then go, okay, I'm, I'm interested. Let me go off and research that some more for myself. And, and um, that's easy enough to do. We, we do that in our lodge. We have a little five to seven minute Masonic education minute. And somebody gets up, speaks for five or six minutes on a particular topic sits down meeting goes on it doesn't doesn't have to be uh a, a you know a, an hour-long dissertation just something to something to pique people's interest um but the um the one of the other differences in pennsylvania where i live we cannot do degree work on a stated meeting night oh okay okay so oh, really? we have extra meetings to deliver yeah so we have extra meetings to do the degree work and depending on how many candidates there are, that determines how many meetings in, uh, in a month there might be. Um, and, but but we also pass them too quickly. That's changing now. The new grandmaster has said um, that there will be proficiency standards um, before progressing through grades. And we're most of us are very very pleased uh, to hear that. It means more work for us, but it means better base than the other yeah. side. So because to, just to go slightly off topic, but on that topic, so your degree work, you've got to learn basically from what I understand, fairly big passages of text to progress to the next levels. Is no, that not in Pennsylvania. Not in Pennsylvania. Not in Pennsylvania. Okay. Because I know yeah. here all we have, we have basically maybe a page or two at max of questions and we just got to learn the answers. So it's right. like, what, what color is the sky? Blue. And then you go right. through them all. If, as long as you get them, then they go, sweet. The night can continue. If you yeah. can't, and uh, speaking with some older brothers, they've been to a couple where they've had to say no because the guy gets up and just knows nothing. And they're That's like, hey, it's, it's not nerves. We can't, you're not ready yet. Yeah. yeah. I mean, and, good, and, good point, Jack. Just if I could cut in there for a second. 
you, you make the point of there needing to be proficiency between degrees. In, in Victoria, we've got this thing called the Masonic Advancement Program. It's actually a situation where in order for you to do your next degrees, and like we said, we've got that 12-month rule between Entered Apprentice and Master Mason, you have to complete a compulsory education seminar. Uh, it's really interactive. It's really sort of designed to help you, um, you know, get an idea of what the hell it is you went through. And it's compulsory. If you don't do your map, we call it, um, you don't get the chance to do your next degree. So, look, there are pros and cons to every program, but I think a system that encourages people to think and ask questions is something that we should be encouraging across the board. You know, I think it's sure. it's positive. Um, but one, one thing I want to sort of get to, I guess, uh, flowing from this conversation is that you're saying that the future of Freemasonry is heading down that path of, um, you know, people more people wanting to know more about some of the esoteric and sort of, I guess, intellectual aspects of what it is we do in our craft. Um, but one thing I guess I want to ask is you guys, would how, how often would you meet in a month on a regular basis? Uh, at Lodge, you mean? Yeah, at Lodge, yeah. At Lodge, we have a A-stated meeting on second Tuesdays, uh, dinner at six, meeting at seven, if you'd like to come. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and then we might meet, we might meet, um, depending on how many candidates there are, we might meet once or twice after that, uh, to confer degree work. And we can sometimes do two, um, three in a night is a long time. Um, that gets the guys home at 11 or so, and that's too late really. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. so, so we might have, um, two or three extra meetings in a month um, yeah. on the outside. That's yeah, interesting. That when you have multiple candidates along night after i was initiated the next week i went to a quad first degree so I had four guys going through um wow. and that was a long night i think we didn't get Shit. out there until about midnight and that tiled at seven i think it was yeah yeah, yeah. there's records in um in my lodge of um meetings in the late 50s um where several months in a row uh, the lodge was closed in harmony at 11:59 p.m. Wow! Uh, <laughs> and, and that meant that meant that it really went into 1:30 or two the next day. Yeah. But by law, by Masonic law, we're not allowed to go into the next day. So they they literally stopped the clock at 11:59. <laughs> That's what time it was when we left. This is this is years when they were bringing in like 35 and 40 men in a year. Yeah, it's crazy. Um, and, and, and that was, you know, post-World War II, the, the boom that, that everybody experienced that, that now, unfortunately, is passing through and, and passing on. Yep. Um, um, to have not prepared for this is, is a shame. It is a shame. And, and I guess um, one of the questions it, it, it prompts me to ask is, you know, rhetorically, that is, is, you know, do we not meet enough or do we not meet as often? Um, we only meet once a month. Um, and it's on that third Tuesday for us and we've got a rehearsal on Tuesday night. We don't do extra meetings for degree work. Uh, nights are usually absorbed with um, copious amounts of what I call Masonic fluff, um, minutes that shouldn't be, you know, it's just really, it's just there for this. I mean, it's not even, it's not even, people say we don't want to change the ancient landmarks, but this stuff is just literally, it's just there for the sake of being there. Some bloke just must have thought, yeah, I'll chuck that in there to make my mark on the ritual or whatever it is. But, um, you know, and, and I don't know what your lodges are like, but ours are very militaristic. Uh, you have to walk, you know, certain ways and you're stepping off on the left foot and you're going back on the right and you're squaring the lodge. And, you know, that's all beautiful, but it does take time. And, you know, all our visitors yes. are paraded in one at a time and the master's brought in under the wand. It's just a exercise of what I call uh, Masonic fluff. But um, I, I, we, we call it apron sniffing. Well, yeah, that's perfect. And I, I, use, I use that. I use I actually stole that. I use it in lodges. Of, <laughs> And, uh, you know, I've yet to pay my royalties, but we'll get to that. Now. Right. <laughs> but let's get into Another the topic. Exactly right. Well, let, let's get into the topic because I'm, I'm curious. I've been worried about time. We did have a bit of a screw up at the start of this episode. It says that we got you two hours later than what we thought we would. So let's. But what let's, I thought you would anyway. Well, that's all right. We'll take, we'll take the blame. But in terms of um, the topic tonight, talking about delving below the, the, uh, the surface of the water, especially for us here in Victoria, we're going to be dedicating this episode to a discussion about the Holy uh, St. John's, and, and we're talking about mainly St. John the Evangelist and St. John the Baptist, and we'll let uh, Jack obviously get into more detail about his perception on that, but just to set the tone, last episode of Masonic Light, 
Jack was saying that he does a great presentation. Well, he wasn't saying, but, you know, other people were saying he does a great presentation on this. And he was saying he'll go to any lodge anywhere in the world. Um, we're still working on the flight plans here, so we'll we'll get that organized. In. <laughs> He's in. So, But with, uh, we thought we'd get him on because our ritual, funny enough, does not talk about... Um, you know, St. John's, the St. John's. I mean, some other degrees I'm in, uh, the Knights Temple degree, I think they're mentioned once or twice uh, in, in passing. Um, but from what I've been able to read and research since uh, we decided we we're going to do this topic, you know, to the idea of the, you know, representational symbolism of the St. John's and Freemasonry being not connected is, is would be abhorrent, would be something that's quite bizarre. And talking to Jack, we've put it like, wow, um, Ritual doesn't even have John in it. I did a, I did a control F. Um, so Jack, maybe you could <laughs> s- maybe you could set up the topic and set in context what it is we're going to be talking about today, and, and obviously um, maybe lead that into some of the you know how why it's so important in American Freemasonry at the very least. Um, it, it probably goes back to the Webb Preston uh, ritual work after the reunification of the two Grand Lodges, um, and the the we still in Pennsylvania, we still have for the most part, the ancient work. We never, we never reunified because there was no grand lodge to modern grand lodge to unify with. So we carried on with the ancient work, but I think even uh, in all of the lodges around me, all of the jurisdictions, um, Maryland, Delaware, New Jersey, New York, all of the States around Pennsylvania all have that web Preston ritual work. And in it, um, that's one of the first things that the, that, the new candidate hears is that he's entering a a lodge dedicated to the Holy Saints, John. Um, In Pennsylvania, we, we, for some reason have dropped um, one of the Saints, John. And to my experience, it's John the Baptist. We no longer recognize, but we do talk about John the evangelist. Um, However, in, in looking into the, the, the meaning of the symbols, and, and here I'm going to back up for a minute and qualify, right? What you're about to hear is my opinion, okay? <laughs> you're allowed to have a so I, I didn't know so, that. So what we're hearing is stone cold facts. <laughs> from Jack. What you're about to hear is my opinion and therefore cannot be wrong, okay? <laughs> uh, so let's not argue the right or wrong of it, but appreciate the, the, the majesty of it, okay? The... The idea of Holy St. John, and, and our candidate here is enter in the name of God and Holy St. John. And across Freemasonry uh, that I'm familiar with, um, these are actually called um, St. John's Lodges. It's, 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 the craft is called the St. John's Lodge. Um, and when you move into York Rite, they no longer refer to it as St. John's Masonry. It's right When you were a, a, a member of St. John's, uh, and, you, and you heard this, you probably hear this in the mark, right? Hmm. Um, that's the, 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 the Saints John are gone from that. So um, when I first heard that and I, and I tried to look a little deeper into it, I, I said, all right, well, you know, who are these Saints John? Uh, actually, who is this Saint John in Pennsylvania? Hmm. Hmm. And then I realized other jurisdictions had both. So I said, okay, who are they? So let's just talk for a minute about who, the saints John are there's John the evangelist. You said it, John the evangelist and John the Baptist, John the Baptist. Um, for those of you who know a little bit about the Bible, um, was a cousin of Jesus. And he was the one who came before him in the wilderness, preparing the way, right? Uh, he was the sackcloth and ashes and eating wild locusts and honey proclaiming, that there's going to be a Messiah come and he's going to free us from these bloody Romans. And he was ready to reestablish the kingdom of David on earth. And that was John the Baptist's mission, more or less. He understood who was coming and he was proclaiming his way, but he saw it as an earthly thing. John the evangelist didn't really care much about earthly things. John the Evangelist's work was almost entirely focused on the kingdom of heaven. So we have those two very different Saints John that we are supposed to take um, consciousness of. And if you you reflect back then again on who were the people who wrote this, they understood that those two symbols 
meant two very different things. And really, in essence, they were two different aspects of the human condition, right? Um, John the Baptist represented the here and now, the flat earth, the what's happening. He represents the action, right? John the Evangelist represents the spiritual realm, um, the kingdom of heaven. So he is more about um, conceptual things, right and wrong, and, and living a holy life. So we take that, you know, we can, we can talk about hermeticism and we can talk about the idea of uh, dualism, um, but we talk about as above, so below, mm -hmm. right? That's a very basic concept in, in both of those um, philosophies. Um, so in, in essence, John the Baptist represents the, the below, the here and now, and John the Evangelist represents the above, the, the spirit of the kingdom of heaven. So um, as as we look at why what what what, all right, what else about the saints John well um, they both have feast days in the church calendar right uh, John the Baptist you you probably know is is June twenty fourth um, we talk about the foundation of uh, the first uh, Grand Lodge at the Goose and Gridiron on June twenty fourth seventeen seventeen and uh, I'll I'll let Jason Richards go crazy about that one. <laughs> Um, but, um, and, and John the evangelist feast day is December 27th. And in my world, that's when the worshipful master gets up, throws off his hat and runs fleeing out of the building oh, okay. because he's done. Right. Um, so, so we have those two feast days and those two feast days coincide almost perfectly, give or take a little bit of declination, um, with the summer and winter solstice right so the the summer solstice uh, is represented by the tropic of cancer you know capricorn capricorn cancer cancer in One the north. Does. Yep. <laughs> right yeah cancer in the north cancer in the north all right so if if that's the day that solstice is the day and that's saint john's day then he represents a horizontal line across the across the earth parallel to the equator that is you know that's mm -hmm. the day right mm -hmm. um in the southern hemisphere um your summer my winter um is john the evangelist's day right so there's there's a very specific um delineation there and if you think about what's happening between those two lines the sun always oscillates between those two lines. So there is always light between those lines. Mm -hmm. Okay, so all right, take it back to what is light. There is always light between those lines. In my lodge, which I was taught to view as a map of the world, the Mappa Mundi, the junior deacon sits at the right hand of the senior warden. The senior deacon sits at the right hand of the worshipful master. The wands that they hold represent those two lines. Oh, uh, okay. Okay. That's a little different in your lodge. Your senior deacon, I think, sits to the north rather than directly beside the worshipful master. So, mm -hmm. um, but it, in my world, that's how I saw it. Right. So an, another aspect um, of of the Saints John is represented in every lodge in the Northern Hemisphere, except Pennsylvania, is a diagram that you looked up and saw. We call it the circumpunct. It's the point within a circle. Yes. The point within a circle, it's, it's, a, it's an ancient symbol. Um, it means a lot of different things in a lot of different faiths or, or theories. Um, it could be the emanations of God from the center. It could be the boundaries of the man, mm -hmm. but it's bounded on either side by two parallel lines. And those in the, in the web Preston ritual, um, the candidate is taught represent the, the two Holy Saints, John. So he's, he's to, he's to restrain his actions, um, between those two, those two people. That's where it comes into the ritual work in that web Preston work. Um, so. 
there's also uh, there's also an idea. I'm not going to get into it about laying out a building and that kind of stuff. But um, in in your in your graphical representations, do you have two pillars? Yeah, we, we do. Anywhere? We do in, in second degree. You don't have them in your lodge, but, right, but you have them board. on the tracing board, yeah. right? Yeah. So, is there anything at the top of those tracing boards? Yeah, you've got the celestial and terrestrial globes or representations. Yep, the the so, chapters. Okay. Yep. So, if you go into either Kings or Chronicles and look at the description of those two pillars, there are nothing in those pillars. They're flat topped, mm. or at least, or mo more probably, they were dished. Um, and they were signal fires, right? Yes. But now, in in current Masonic iconology, um, those two globes represent what? The physical Earth. Yes. And the celestial realm. Yes. Right. The the physical and the and the spiritual nature of the man. Those are two more representations of that duality, that as above, so below concept. So um, the the checkered floor which I know from your diagram that you have the checkered floor in your, in your work, right? Mm -hmm. The checkered floor is what black and white. It is also that duality, that good and evil, rich, poor, sick, well, wealthy, you know, whatever. Um, and, and it's arranged in such a way that it's almost impossible for the candidate to step on it without stepping on both. Mm. Right. And when that candidate steps forward, and you mentioned before, you're always supposed to step off with your left foot. And this is why I asked this question earlier on the link. Um, so to take a, a step forward with the left foot is um, in, in Latin, left foot is sinistra pedi, right? And the root word there is sinister or sine in Latin. And we have that, that word sinister, but it's sine actually means without, absent, right? So you take a step forward with the foot that is without God, it's absent God, and then you bring the foot of the righteous to meet it. So as you're walking through this ritual work, you're, you're you're responding to that duality again and again and again, right? So all of these things were laying there. I don't know if they're real or not. I could be making these up completely. <laughs> but if I am, it's pretty cool. It I is. like it. It is. Um, That's why you need to write a book. Once it's in a book, it becomes fact. Ah, oh, well, there you go. There you go. <laughs> Night and low mass. That those are the two. I'm gonna. I'm gonna. Stick to it. Yeah. 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 Um, but again, that that duality comes back to us. And, and this is why I asked you about the square and compasses. Because the square teaches us to do what? Uh, regulate our lives and actions according to Masonic line and rule. Is that correct? Okay. Yeah. To, 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 to square our yeah. actions. Yes. Right? But the compasses teach us to do what then? Um, keep ourselves Just in due bound with all our brethren in Freemasonry. Uh, circumscribe our desires and keep them yes. within due bounds. Yes. Desires. That's the spirit. Right? Mm -hmm. So we have the square representing the physical and the compasses representing the spiritual. Okay? How are they positioned? And I'm not going to ask you to say this, but think about how they are positioned for the entered apprentice degree. Which is above the other? Well, the square is above the compasses. That's not giving anything away. The, uh... so, the, so the square is dominant. The physical nature of the man is preeminent in his life. Mm -hmm. As he moves through the degrees the spiritual nature begins to emerge itself. Yes. And as a master Mason, what controls his life? The spiritual nature. Yes. Right? So in my world, the square and compasses are the two saints, John. Oh, I can. I can. And every time you see that, you think about 
when I see the square and compasses now, I see them differently. And, mm. and I see them reminding me more clearly that I'm flawed. I'm, 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 I'm my, my animal nature is coming, you know, but the spiritual nature should always be on top. It should always be able to suppress that. And that's my, that's the gist of my talk on the, on the Holy Saints, John, they are everywhere in your lodge. Um, and it's unfortunate. Well, it's not unfortunate. It's just the evolution of your work. Um, it, it, but, but it's a, it's a very powerful tool and, and, and we're taught all these lessons by, um, but through symbols and allegories, right? Because we each, ex we each experience the lessons through the prism of our own experience. Yes. So, um, so if you, if you, if you have this understanding of what these symbols mean, then you can apply them more easily in your life yes. for me anyway. Well, I've got, I've got a lot of questions arising from what you've just said there. So, um, but thank uh -oh. you very much for giving a very comprehensive, um, and I, what, what I have to say, powerful overview of that relevance of that symbolism. And I think you've touched on what you've done actually by mentioning things like dualism and the physical and the spiritual, you've actually encapsulated a lot of naturally what our ritual does, but you've also linked it to the, the St. John's symbolism as well, which I think is, which is what we're missing. And I will say it is unfortunate because having done my brief research since we decided to do this topic, it, it seems so powerful. Um, but let, let's talk about, let's stick on the nerdy line of going down the rabbit hole with some of this stuff, because there's certain things I want to talk about. Sure especially dualism, um, which I'm very passionate about as an idea, as a concept. Um, but then later on, what we might do is we'll talk about perhaps some, you know, some thought bubbles. None of it's obviously based in fact, but thought bubbles as to why maybe it isn't as prominent here in Victoria, because I think our listeners might find that interesting. It might be, I think you'll find it's actually a representation of our culture as a society rather than, rather than any, more than anything. But getting to dualism... Um, the minute you mentioned the idea of the spiritual and the physical, the first thing that came to my mind was obviously the the, 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 the globes or the, the that are on top of the uh, the two pillars, sure. uh, the celestial and terrestrial. Uh, in past episodes of this podcast, we've discussed dual, dual, dualistic thinking as an idea of black or white, or um, you know right or wrong, and these two things that these things that seem to happen in the world. How much a lot of that, I guess, is is sort of down to human nature we are very symmetrical beings we, we you know geometry plays a big part in not only our psychology but our you know our biology as well we're, we're we're actually really prone to look for patterns and to look for things that are that have a sure. symmetry in nature now unfortunately for us um a lot of things in the world are actually not as symmetrical as we'd like them to be um and i guess one of the biggest things about dualism which i want to ask you about is the fact that whilst we have black or whites, and I find a lot of accountants think like this, they think it's you know, yes or no, or you know, they checkbox sort of thinking. There is a lot in the world that is quite grey. Uh, in in my profession, in the craft of the law, we look at the grey. We look at the interaction between um, the, the two polar opposites in, in the way that the societies regulate their conduct. I want to ask you a question with this idea of St. John the Baptist and St. John the Evangelist, and, and just to sort of, and correct me if I'm wrong, my researchers indicate that St. John the Evangelist is probably a representation of a lot of the St. John's, that fit, you know, St. John the, the disciple, the John the disciple, and a few other figures of John in the right. New he's Testament. Right, he's thought to be an amalgam, yeah. Yeah, he's an amalgam of a number of characters, so it is interesting right. in that respect. But from your point of view, how much is there any interaction between these two dualist dualistic ideas and what I call the gray? Is there any lesson in that? I mean, I know you're saying that there's this idea of the sun permeating between the two, um, but mm -hmm. is, what do you think about that concept of of, of the gray? Um, I, I, yes, there is obviously gray, um, but what is gray if it's not made up of both black and white? Yeah. Uh, so if 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 we pixelate it and draw down to the micro scale or, or the nano scale, you'll, you'll find small boxes of black and small boxes of white. So I think gray is, um, gray is the area that, you, that in the law anyway, you have to apply the compasses to the gray mm. yes. um, in, order, in order to understand um, where that decision has to come from. I, yes. I don't think there's enough of that right now. No. Um, but, but yeah, there's, there certainly is gray. Um, 
what we're what we're telling i think what what the black and white speaks to is the fact that we have to be at some at some level sympathetic to the fact that you can't be altogether black or altogether white you, you know you go to the yin and yang and, mm. and and you look at that symbol and there's a little black dot in the little white half right and there's a little white dot in the little black half and that's not an accident mm. so yeah. um, i think i think i think being sympathetic to the fact that there there are, are both in that color is a, a lesson to take out of it yeah i mean in my view and this is just my obviously interpretation of freemasonry one of the prevailing permeating lessons of freemasonry in my view is balance um it's about and even even using the the point within a circle i, I know it can mean a lot of things but finding that position where you feel at balance with your life the things around you the yes. spiritual the physical i mean i think that if if i were to sum up freemasonry to someone they say what does it teach you um, i'd say it teaches you balance and i think that in today's world that's very relevant but you know, this idea of having um, a manifestation of through the degrees of this progression away from the pure physical sort of aspects of our society, I guess that also includes the materialistic, the here and now, towards a more spiritual understanding of our lives and places in the universe, mm -hmm. is probably the act of rebalancing human beings away from what we seem to be obsessed with, which is how we look, what we have people around us rather than the more sort of subtle aspects of human nature which were probably more relevant at the time that the ritual was written right so i find it very interesting that these two sort of christian and i guess they are christian you could say abrahamic but particularly christian um sort of disciples and, and saints are, are sort of used as a chance to articulate that story now my question to you is obviously in in the in your in your jurisdiction the ancient ritual is something that is more prominent which is great because i think the ancient ritual is much better than the moderns uh, that's just my experience <laughs> um we do an emulation ritual or a version of emulation ritual and, and we've obviously got that modern modern sort of cut through it in terms of the prominence of saint john the baptist and saint john the evangelist do you think that that was simply a representation of what would have been at the time the ritual was written, a very well understood, you know, no need for description sort of allegory that people would have got instantly. Um, I mean, let's just cast ourselves back 350 years. If I said to a random on the street, um, Saint Saint John the Baptist and Saint John the Evangelist, we're going to use that as a story for duality, people would just be like, oh yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Whereas today, considering the secularization of the world um, and moving oh, yeah. away from understanding of biblical stories, it becomes a lot more. Um, difficult and I guess I'm just trying to figure out maybe that's why it doesn't play a prominence in our ritual here um, because of the as particularly in Australia the secularization of society so but do you think that at the time the uh, allegory was was something that would have been well understood but common people back at 350 years ago uh, I, I think you have to stratify society a little bit and say you know who are you are you talking about um... Are you talking about lettered people? Well, the, yeah, um, the people who can read and write, I suppose. Um, yeah, yeah, I, yeah, I think the people who can read or write generally learn to read or write by reading the Bible. Uh, so those stories are very fresh to them and very, very clear and clean. And, and they would have, an, I would think that they would have had uh, an understanding of that. Um, the, the, the masses that show up on Sunday, you know, to not go to hell. Um, maybe not, mm -hmm. uh, but maybe, you know, I, we'll never know. I, we weren't. We can't really, um, we can't really understand the, that that aspect of it. But I, I think we had um, we had Mark Tabert on our show um, several months ago, and I don't know if you've read anything that Mark has produced, but um, very passionate guy. And uh, he said, um, we said, you know, what what do we need to do in Freemasonry? And he just you could just about hear him pounding the table. You need to read the Bible. Mm. If you're not reading the Bible, you just won't get it. And and that was a harsh lesson um, because the lesson, you know, it's all in there. And they're, but but they're in there as teaching tools, right? They're not. It's not. It's not dogmatic in that we have to we have to obey that. Um, they're there as as instruments to refamiliarize us with these lessons. Um, because what you were saying earlier is uh, you, we're looking for universal truths, and that's what that's what the authors were writing to were the universal truths of human society. 
and and in that respect, and I think it has to be there. So, yes. interesting. Quick, quick question for you then, uh, for the uh, our visiting Jack, I'll say. Um, so, given all of that, how even now we're noticing that there's not the meaning behind these allegories are a, a bit lost because people aren't, as you were saying, reading the Bible that much. Do you think that in like going in the future that the craft will need to change to bring those stories in more? Because thinking as even as Jack was saying before, how we're not as religious as we once were um, for the Bible religion. I think that personally that there's been a bit of a shift that we're moving away from your standard Christianity, Catholicism and moving more to a religion of technology. I mean, you look at, people these mm. days you look at people these days there's your mac people and windows people and that's basically a religious war waiting to happen when you yeah. get those people that are very one-sided on that they're more passionate than i think the christians ever were back in the day um but do you think the craft will need to change to really adapt and sort of say here's what we're saying now here's the actual meaning or story behind it um that's a great question, Dave. I, I don't know. I, I don't. I, I don't want that to happen. Mm. I don't want. I don't want the language to change because the language is beautiful. Um, I want. I want people to, and and it's not going to be everybody. It's only going to be that small percentage of people that really dig for it that are going to find that spiritual aspect of it. Um, and mm. and if it's twenty percent, I'd be surprised. Uh, but I think that. I think that what's there really needs to be preserved. I mean, we, here's the thing. It's, it's 300 plus years old. It may be, it may be 800 years old, right? If you go back to the Regis poem and, 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 and the, the old original, you know, operative masonry, um, as a, as a code of conduct in life, we don't need to be fixing that. Mm -hmm. I'm really loath to, to go tamper with that, but I think you're right. I think we're moving away from, from classical traditional, um, religious doctrine, if you will. And, but we are moving towards something spiritual. Yes. Um, yeah. I, I think there's a lot of people looking for spirituality in their lives. Um, but they're so frustrated by the, by the business of the church. Um, that they're looking for something else. And we'll put our hand up and say, hey, we're a business, but mm. we got some cool stuff you might like, right? Yeah. Well, so, yeah. well, I must admit, that's what I do find interesting is there was the big shift in the last probably 30, 40 years away from traditional churches and religions for the mainstream. There was still always your believers, people who believe, but for the majority of people, you walk up to anyone in the street and say, are you, are you a religious person? Most people will go, well, no, or oh, yeah, I'm Christian, but I'm not practicing or anything like that. But I find it fascinating that, and when seeing this more in Freemasonry, when the younger people come, they're really craving that spirituality yes. side of it. So it's like, well, hold on, we spent decades moving away from it to now go, okay, but now what do we fill it with? And as I said, a lot of people seem to be filling that with dedications to technologies, which... I mean, it's hard to say whether that's good or bad. I think there's probably bad because it, I mean, there's no real lessons there. But then it's the question does remain: How do we bring the old religious text r into the relevant world where people aren't going, "Oh, that's that ancient thing," and I don't want to live on bread and water. By by, I think you do that by shrouding it in mystery and mm. making it special. Mm. Um, and and if if you make it special and like you know. Um, there are none so blind as those who will not see, right? You yeah. Know, it's, it can be right in front of you. And if you're, if your eyes are closed to it, you're not going to see it no matter how flat spelled out it is. So um, almost go back to the, the good old days where the only people that really knew anything were the ones that were learned and read and go, right, how do I read, right and actually study the book? Yeah. yeah uh, if you're not willing to do the work, you're not going to get the benefits of, of the knowledge. That's, that's I think, embedded in the craft. Yeah, I think this is a really interesting discussion. Um, it's funny because uh, a big part of the paper that I'm writing at the moment, um, I'm actually in the second part and I'm trying to deal with 
some recommendations to deal with some of the secularization of society and there's a fantastic quote um, which I can only really recite verbatim but it's from a book um, the author of which his last name is Boomer and he says um, the the modern the modern articulation of spirituality is not necessarily anti-religious it's actually simply a move away a moving away from the centralization and control of religion in the state and the and, and the church it's this idea that religion's going back to what and I don't know how many people know much about civil the civil war in England but this idea of a personal god a puritanistic sort of um, re personal relationship that doesn't need idols or doesn't need this concept of, a, of an institution that articulates it now because of that all the data suggests that there is a growing hostility and rejection of institutionalized religion and my concern is that if the craft is seen to be part of that mix or part of that grouping then ultimately de facto a lot of younger people our future membership at least are going to say well we're not interested because you know you guys are just a re-articulation of these old institutions that are antiquated but i think what you're talking about jack is basically saying well look we do have these lessons that are you know embedded in in this cultural her heritage of these institutional religions but it's more than that it's something that we can couch in mystery it's something we can make uh, available to people in a way that is going to say well look come in get involved learn a moral lesson or two for these old allegories and also then dive into some of the more spiritual elements that are open to your subjective intellect and that's what separates us from free from religion isn't it we're not dogmatic it, it, it absolutely is and i you know i i somehow came across the phrase with one of the new candidates in our lodge i said um you know we're not gonna show you where the buried treasure is we're gonna hand you a shovel and tell you where to dig um so they all have to find it for themselves they have to be willing to put the work in to uncover that stuff but they're only going to do that if they're interested in it yes mm. and 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 there is a there's a lot and you're seeing it there's a lot of younger men that are joining the fraternity that are coming in looking for it yes and when they don't find it they leave and as you would um, as you would and, and, uh, as, of course as you would um, because people don't have the time and I know people, some older mem members of the fraternity cringe um, at this idea, which I hope we can dispel through myths, uh, through facts rather than myth, but people don't have the time, the money or the resources to dedicate themselves to something that they find no net positive benefit from. Absolutely. Um, I mean, that's a new test I'm proposing in my paper, the net positive benefit test. I know it sounds a bit legalistic, but this idea of people need to get more out of it than they get in, uh, they put in, right? And they need to be able but to... They need to be able to come to the craft and be given something that's going to actually, you know, they can walk away with and say, well, it was worth my time and investment. If people rock up and, and all we're doing is reading minutes and passing treasury accounts, I mean, I can think of 10 or 15 organizations they could join where they could do that. But if what sure. we're doing is we're saying, well, we'll give you a taste into some of the symbolism that we've got through these ritualist, these ceremonies, um, and then the doors open from there if you want to open them then that's something I think that the net positive benefit test you know, satisfies because you're walking away saying, well, I'm getting value for money here. I'm getting value for my time and energy. I, 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 only, I only differ from what you said in, in when you used the phrase, give them. Um, hmm. it, it, because if you give that, that which is attained without cost has no value. Yeah. yeah. So, so they have to find it. They have to, we have to make it available to them. We have to give them a mechanism that they can find it with, with which they can find it. Um, but, but they have to do the work. And this is what I've learned in the four years that I've been doing this Masonic education is I've been puking on the, on the candidates, all of this fantastic Masonic wisdom. And they go, aha, uh aha. -huh, uh -huh. Uh, and they're gone and it, it it only matters to the person that it's going to matter to and i think a big part of what we're trying to do is is make it matter to everybody mm. and it's not there's no. I've, I've i've enumerated five different slices of this masonic pie there's the historical aspect of it which is unreasonably cool um there's the philosophical side there's the fellowship side there's the philanthropic side and and then there's some other damn side that I can't mm, remember right mm, now. Mm, yes, but but yeah. all of those components, 
Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, but but all of those components are available to whoever wants to select the one or two or three that he's most interested in. We just have to make sure that there's something there for for them to do that. I know our lodge doesn't do nearly enough social stuff outside yep. of lodge. Yep. Um, and and um, uh, you know we don't we don't perform enough services. We don't um, we don't study history. We don't we don't look at that that old stuff we we don't have the research group in house that gets together and presents a paper to the lodge once in a while we 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 don't 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 <laughs> right so if if you got all them don'ts then that guy's going to leave yes but i i just i just don't want to hand it to him and say here's all this cool knowledge now you're great you know it it, it won't work it's, so it's it's a hollow fine. One question then, do you think that what may help to engage, because I know one of the issues we have, we'll have talks and there's, we've seen it um, real, um, last year or so when uh, the Blue Lounge was looking at putting together an education portal and we got pretty much a lot of educational material, a lot of talks and stuff, but I found the big problem with it was it was all just, here's a paper, someone stands there and reads it, sits down, job done. And I remember ages ago, Jack and I were talking about it, and a few of us have, have discussed it going, that's not a very good engaging way. It's better to do a bit of a talk and then open for discussion. Let people in the lodge discuss what was said, what was hypothesized, whatever the case may be, to try to engage people. And I think even the younger guys, that's potentially get, may work to engage them and go, actually, I have a question about what you said. Why is this the case? Yes, I mean, exactly. you're right. If, if they're completely not interested, they'll sit there and just go to sleep. But right. for those people that are, they'll go, but hold on, what does this mean? Why have you said that? I want to learn more. Where can right. I go? I want, to, I want to challenge that little piece of data that you had right there. Yeah. I, mm. um, you're, you're, yes. And isn't that exactly what we three are doing right now? Yes, of course. Right. And, and, and we're doing it in a forum where at least a dozen people might see it. Or listen to it. <laughs> maybe um, maybe five people, including us. So, <laughs> uh, so, so yes, I, I think we're getting there, and and that's why I say we're exactly where we need to be. We're we're making that shift from the good old boy. I'm gonna give you a square deal on a new car mm. to um, to this idea of w we have an opportunity um, to help you understand philosophically. You know why you need to make changes in your life. Mm. And um, we have the opportunity to do that for people. We, we, I think right now are at the, at the very vanguard of that shift in what Freemasonry is. Yes. And no, I, I I, it's a very exciting time to be a Mason right now. And, and for all the people that are crying about lodges closing and, buildings being sold and, and that kind of stuff. Sure. Beautiful building. That's a shame. Why didn't somebody plan for that? Yes. Mm. Um, there was no you problem. know, why, why is it you, you've had 40 years to figure out that you need to save money to support this building in perpetuity. So your fault, move on. Well, well, uh, I know one, one thing that Jack and I've talked about and it's something, it's one of those things that I'm very passionate about, which is bringing more technology into Lodge and enabling brothers who are old or sick or unavailable to come to be able to still turn up into lodge yep. i remember a while ago um jack and i were talking about doing a it was an idea that jack had it was basically a, a test lodge as it were where we can go right let's throw out the the rule book and try different things see if it works mm -hmm. because that's the only way that we're going to be able to then go to grand lodge or go to other lodges and go look what you're doing now is just forcing people away but hey if you're bring this in or do that or move, change this about, then they can do it while still preserving those ancient landmarks. Yeah, that being the and, caveat, isn't it? The, the idea of the Masonic, we're dealing with the Masonic fluff here. Um, why do we have to bring visitors in? It's, you know, this is how we do it in Victoria and most people overseas look at us and think we're mad. Why do we bring in visitors sequentially um, and go through 20 minutes of introductions when they come to the meeting every month, we know who they are? Um, you know, th these sorts of things. Why do we have to move and read out correspondence that the secretary reads that really the only the secretary and the committee of general purposes needs to know about why do we 
why do we do these Masonic fluff things that we do? And the idea is, let's have an innovative environment. I know that's a dirty word in Freemasonry, but let's have an environment where <laughs> we can actually question the status quo and say, well, look, the ancient landmarks say nothing about how we read out the minutes. So why do we read out the minutes this way, right? The ancient landmarks say nothing about, you know, when we're delivering someone from a certain part of the lodge to do the secrets that we have to do a full perambulation, we could just cut across the corner and there, you know what I mean? This is just Masonic fluff. And but, but believe me, Jack, people get very passionate about, you know, oh, yeah. oh, you have to do oh, the perambulation. Yeah. It has no symbolic yeah. significance, but you have to do it because my dad did it that way and his dad did it that way. I mean, well, I know, I know the biggest issue we have in Victoria is a lot of the charges that we deliver is, and Jack and I have talked about this, we're like, need some animation some of them that are quite lengthy it sounds like you're just talking down to the candidate but mm -hmm. it's more you want to be having a conversation with them but especially in victoria there's no pointing there's no moving you have to be a statue just same. reading something out and that, same here yeah and i'm a very animated person and i'm like oh, that annoys me really? <laughs> <laughs> I'm shocked, damn it! I'm shocked. I know. I've got friends that go, "Do you have any Greek in you? Because you're always talking with your hands." You, got, you have like, to move the hands. Yeah, you have to. But I mean, this is the same thing. When I do a charge, at least I, I don't really care that. I, I mean, I, I think I'm an okay ritualist, but you know, I get up and do the final charge. For example, the charge after initiation, which I think is reasonably consistent in all the jurisdictions. Um, well, at least the one in Hawaii, I saw yes. it's ex exactly I, the same. Yeah, yeah, I read. I read through it. It's very similar. It's worded a little differently, but. Yes, we've, we've got a bit of a bone to pick that there's no trowel in it, but, you know, that's that's just our Victorian uh, rubbish. But in terms of the way I deliver that, it's it's a very purposeful, um, you know, very deliberate charge because you, you're not just sitting there saying, well, here's the rules of the order and you have to do this, this and this to be good. You, you, you're delivering them the essence of what it is they just went through and you're telling them about their duties to God, to their neighbour and to themselves. That's serious stuff. I mean, it should be a conversation. Right. But going back to earlier, I mean, I, I, I do understand what you're saying and I concede the point that, um, you know, we can't just give people things uh, without any sort of venture or journey. There needs to be some there needs to be some form of work put into it. My concern is, I guess, um, is the way we do it. I mean, looking at millen the millennial generation, employers are struggling. They're, they're, they're at a loss, actually. It's, it's, a, it's a real interesting time in history. Employers don't know how to handle millennials. Um, they don't know what to do. They're putting a lot of money into research. The research is coming back conflicted about how do we mentor, manage, and support millennials through basic structures. One of the biggest issues with millennials is the the need for instant gratification, the need for a constant reassurance that what they're doing is right. Uh, they lack self confidence, um, and they also have this lack of patience for things like time and experience and waiting for things. Now, we've got a lot, and that is. And that is anathema to Freemasonry. I, I right? agree with you. I agree with you. So, and this is the point of my paper we're writing. We're in a lot of trouble. We've, we've got a less religious, very impatient, screwed up generation. I mean, as Simon Sinek says, who's a is a renowned um, person who works in management consultant, he said that they were just dealt a bad hand. They were a result of failed parenting strategies in a lot of respects. And we've yeah. got a situation now where we've got this wonderful institution, Jack, but we need to hand it off eventually. Um we, we, our population, I think in America, the largest living population is the millennial generation uh, out of all the generations if they were to be segregated. And we've got to hand it off. So what do we do to, to help these people integrate? We can't just turn around and say, well, you've got to change. It's not going to happen. Um, and this is why I think we need our people like you, and I wish we had more people like you here in Victoria, actively helping, mentoring, and, and helping these people through those journeys if they want to take that path. The problem is with the millennials, they're not going to do it by themselves. They want little goals set. They want constant reassurance, all this rubbish. But unfortunately, we adapt or die. I mean, I give them candy give every them time candy. they do something right. Just <laughs> yeah. give them a chocolate. Anyway, so what's your thoughts on that? Sorry, without me going on a monologue about how screwed we are. But what's your thoughts ah. on that? What, what's your thoughts on that? Uh, I, I think we need to create an app. Uh, yeah, good, idea. good idea. Good yes. idea. That'll be it. <laughs> Just That'll fix everything. <laughs> yeah. I just think we need to use our Masonic connections and embed Freemasonry in everything from video games to movie, real subliminal messaging style. I thought we did that. Yeah, that's, worked, <laughs> that's worked really well so far. Yeah. Um, I, 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 okay, so um, millennial generation, by definition, less religious, yes. Are they less spiritual? I don't know. Hard to quantify, yeah, but yeah, but good point. Yeah. That's, that, 
it's a different it's a different thing i think they are spiritual many are and again you know you see a, a huge block and and you want the block to be 100 percent um at best you're going to get two to three percent that are going to be hits right um here's me being me <laughs> be extremely excited for the two or three percent and don't worry about the rest of them. They weren't yours anyway. You can't lose what you never had, mm. right? But if you have them, if you get them, if they come through the door and give you a petition, make it worth having, right? Give them give them that thing that they're looking for. And they're looking in some respects for the spiritual. They're looking in some respects for the camaraderie. Um, they're, they're looking for that historical connection. They're looking for all, on the fifth one was ritual. I forgot ritual. <laughs> This little piggy went to ritual school. Yeah. Um, they're looking for those things, some more than others, right? But they're looking for those things and we have to give them to them in a, in a friendly, um, you know, um, companionable way. And, and that's oh, companionable. <laughs> reflect, reflect for a moment on your lodge and the men on the sidelines. Yeah. Are they companionable? Right. No. Are they when that when that 23 year old walks through the door and says, hi, I'm a Mason. What's that 78 year old, uh, you know, fellow on the sidelines going to say to that guy? Hey, we have lots in common. Yeah. Let's go. Let's go have a pint. You know, no, no. he's going to say, are you doing kids taking over the lodge? Yep. Rrr, rrr. Yep. And I'm and believe me, I'm turning into that guy. Yes. I'm. I'm you, you sound I'm, a lot I'm, like you know, that. I'm well, I, you know, I, I had to, I had to renew my passport. I had to renew my passport about two months ago, and it came to the box that said "color of hair," and I just, ah, oh. yeah. <laughs> but you can you write down identify with color? Or... Damn, that's, it's, yeah, that hurt me a lot. It hurt me a lot. Well, but would one, one solution? Thinking about it a bit practically. And uh, apologies to interrupt, but would one solution be to segregate, well, not necessarily segregate, but different, like separate the lodges. So you go, right, this lodge is a fun lodge. They just go out drinking all the time. This lodge is a historical lodge. They talk about that to try so that when someone comes to go, right, what are you interested in? Here's right. the best no, fit for they, you. They're, they're calling those affinity lodges. Um, <laughs> right. And they're very popular in England. Um, uh, they're, they're, not, they're not catching on in Pennsylvania. Um, I don't, I don't think globally the grandmasters are, are all together behind that concept yet, but mm -hmm. I think it might be coming. Um, as far as, as far as separating them out, um, I think, uh, I think that there are three columns that support the roof of the lodge, wisdom, strength, and beauty. Sounds right? very Masonic. Beauty is, beauty is the new ones coming in strength is the guys that have been there for five, 10, 15 years. They're doing the work. They're in the chairs. They have the tuxedos. The, the wisdom is, is, is the past masters and the old timers on the sidelines who really have a tremendous amount of, of wisdom and knowledge and life experience that they could share with us if we gave them the right environment to do it in. And yes. I don't think we do that either. So I, they're both the resources on both ends of the scale. Um, so I, I, you know, I, I would hate to segregate them out because the, the lodge with all the old guys is going to close. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, and because eventually it's just going to, it's just going to wither. Um, but we have to engage all of those age groups together and all of those, um, life stages, uh, have to all come together and support yes. the roof of the lodge. That's, you know, mm -hmm. and you asked me about how does, how does this, uh, how does this come into my life and how does this this stuff that I've learned affect me? This is how I look when I'm when I'm asked a question like that. I reflect on the ritual work um, we, we years ago remodeled our lodge. And every time we um, we got into a, a, a sticking point between a couple of us, um, we I, I reflected on the passage in, in our work where the uh, uh, where after mature deliberation, they finally agreed. Okay, so I get what you're saying, Jack. In terms of the um, sort of segregation aspect, which David was talking about, I, I think what mainly he was saying was special interest in the idea of getting lodges that have a particular uh, attracting value to them. And I understand in the U UK they've had this sort of affinity lodge approach, and I'm not necessarily convinced mm -hmm. that it works. But 
one thing I guess that is I guess sort of needs to be accepted is the fact that the lodge needs to have something about it that attracts its members. It needs to be an experience that's positive. Um, at the moment, I feel a people a lot of a lot of people go to lodge and they might even have a positive experience, but they look around and think, well, it's great, but judging by the demographic, it's not going to be here in five years. Um, and I'd, I'm not sure if I want to put my time and effort into something that's going to be dead, um, which which is depressing, but it's it's a reality of our ageing membership. I think in Victoria, our average age is 65 and a half. Um, I'm not sure if it's higher or lower where you are, but it does create difficulties. But I think what you're saying is, is, is the truth in the sense that we need to have lodges where the generations break down those differences and come together and unite around universal uh -huh. principles, right? That's what it's Absolutely. Like. Exactly correct. Well, I, I could not have said it any better. Um, we have we have social strata in our lodge that comes together that way now. Hmm. Um, and we have we have at some level ages that come together in that way now. So in, I'm I'm blessed in the lodge that I'm in um, because we have a lot of that now. Uh, I'm not sure it was always like that, but it is now. And, uh, you know, my thing and you'll hear people say it um you know my my mantra is be the change you want to see in your lodge um if, if you want to see your lodge be different then be different yeah. and and help other people become different with you and that's um that's a big piece that gets missed you know we we live in this uh, uh in this committee-based world where you know the committee on social things ought to do something social uh well just Arrange something social. Just do it. Just have do a it. picnic. Just do it. Tell 20 guys you can have a picnic, right? Yeah. Um, it doesn't have to go to the committee to have meetings and minutes and past and blah, 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 blah. We live in this committee world. Uh, the committee on uh, sick and visitation, the committee on <laughs> widows. I can't I can't name a widow that we've gone to see. Yeah. Because there's a committee for that, right? That's, uh, yeah, that, that we can't do. We have to, we have to be, we have to be the, kinds of masons that that we expected to meet when we got here yeah. and i think that will make the change i'm 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 very i'm very hopeful about the future of freemasonry i think the world needs freemasonry yeah no i agree i think we're more relevant now than we've ever been absolutely um, and i think that the future is bright we just got to make sure we have the conversations and, and that we need to have we need to get through that cringy process of getting that change uh, underway and you know it's great that yeah. podcasts like ours do that in different ways uh, from different angles but but jack um i appreciate you you uh i mean we we did go a little bit off topic but yeah the essentials of what we want to cover were covered i think um in terms of i mean you probably wanted to, you wanted to cover a lot more but unfortunately uh we get criticized by larry about the length of our episodes and this is going to be another <laughs> another lengthy one i think it's because he can't sit on the couch for 20 minutes without falling asleep but um you know he's already asleep yeah he's already he's, he was sleeping an hour ago on this episode so you know exactly. this is the this is the thing but i just want to say to you um thank you so much for taking the time to really Give us that passionate, and it was passionate, sort of uh, delivery, delivery of, of your perspe perspective on the significance of the symbolism of the St. John's, and, and in particular, then going into some of the more, um, you know, deeper understanding of dualism and this idea of representative symbolism throughout the entire Lodge process, and then having oh, an idea yeah. of how younger members can actually, or members any generally, but particularly younger members who are interested can come in and actually tap into the surface of that and deep and dive deeper it's been really really good and speaking on behalf of david and me i'm sure i really want to thank you for for taking the time to walk us through that i found it very valuable oh it's an honor any time that's great and look david um i think what we might do is we'll wrap up the topic by giving final quick final thoughts and then we'll go into our ad with the happy mason so any final thoughts on the topic david Oh, I think it's a it's a fantastic topic, and it's one that uh, that I think I'm going to definitely do some more research on. Uh, I was while Jack was speaking, I was trying to work out ways that we could get him to do a present the full presentation at Brunswick United. So I don't know. We I'll keep thinking about that because I think the times might be a bit a uh, bit bad for you, Jack. But so we may need to get you to record it, which might make question and answer time a bit difficult. Well, we fly uh, over one of those. I mean, I'm happy we fly over. Yeah, <laughs> we we can we can use some of uh, Jack's blue lounge money. <laughs> no that could work yeah. yeah that could for sure work and and yeah absolutely i have a current passport so that works too yeah let's, let's get him over here <laughs> that's my view but jack do you have any final thoughts on the topic before we get into some upcoming events and shameless plugs 
I have a final thought to share with you on the nature of the differences between our works. Yes, go ahead. We had a we we had a we raised a man from uh, who, from Wales in our lodge, and his father was a past grand orator of the Grand Lodge of Wales. So he came to visit our lodge, and when it was all done, we said, "So, how, how, what'd you think?" And he said, "Well, all the bits are there. It's rearranged a bit." <laughs> He's, and, and then he said something that I will remember for my whole Masonic career. He said, it's a bit like a painting of the same subject, but by a different artist. Yeah. And yeah. I just love that. It's beautiful. So yeah. um, it's, it's beautiful that your work is different. Um, learn why it's different. Um, you know, dig into that. That's a rabbit hole that's fun to run down. Um, I, I had to do it because nobody could tell me. So that, that's a great place to start well that's definitely something thank we'll you do for, yeah thank you for having me again uh, no problem at all jack it's an absolute honor and um that's definitely something we will do and we have been doing and i guess for our listeners i hope that you got as much out of that as we did in terms of the real sort of value that you know shows that i think that's a beautiful beautiful analogy you said there you know the idea of we all see freemasonry we're looking at the same thing but through different angles and i think that's uh, that's very very important uh, to realize that you know freemasonry universal sure but um we're looking at it through different angles which is which is just as beautiful so let's get into um obviously david we have a very big responsibility on this podcast to mention our favorite sponsors which is of course the happy mason store um maybe you could lead us into that david since you are so good at it yeah most certainly it's always a pleasure to uh, talk about our favorite sponsors uh obviously if you do need any form of uh, Masonic regalia, be sure to check them out. I know I've spoken to a few lodges I've been to, and there's a bit of talk about people wanting to replace their old ratty cotton uh, entered apprentice aprons with some fantastic new ones. But I think, Jack, you say it best in this little ad that you recorded. So now, a word from our sponsors. The Happy Mason Shop, the official sponsor of the Brought to Light Masonic Podcast and the Blue Lounge Social Club. Supporting Freemasons wherever they may be scattered across both Australia and the world globally, the Happy Mason Shop is providing you with access to some of the world's most finest Masonic regalia at the most competitive and affordable prices. Do you need new aprons for your lodge? Whether it be your tatty entered apprentice aprons or fellow craft aprons that need replacing, or whether it be other furnishings or items it could use to enhance your lodge's presence, or are you being raised a sublime degree of a master mason and require your own master mason's apron and don't want to use that second-hand apron that the lodge is offering you, then jump on the happymasonshop.com.au, click on the Blue Lounge link, and purchase those items to provide yourself with access to some of the UK's best handmade Masonic wares that have been imported into Australia and provided to you at the best affordable price courtesy of the Happy Mason Shop. The Happy Masons and the Blue Lounge Social Club are united in their sponsorship and partnership, focusing on the recruitment, retention and education support of young Masons and the achievement of Masonic excellence. So check out their store. Every purchase you make via the Blue Lounge link will result in support for us and this podcast, which the Happy Masons are proud to sponsor. So, what are you waiting for? Get your new Masonic regalia at thehappymasonshop.com.au. Welcome back. And yes, that was a word from me about our sponsors. And yes, we're just having a bit of a laugh because on the unedited version, which you might see online, David does this usual uh, sort of noise to fill in the fact where we insert the episode and Jack found it hilarious. But that's the nature Maybe of doing podcasts. Been stolen from Jeopardy. <laughs> Uh, that's the nature of doing podcasts. Uh, the unedited versions are usually the funnest to listen to. But uh, let's get into some shameless plugs. And of course, David, I actually haven't got too much to report. Uh, there's all quiet on the Western Front here in in Victoria. Looking um, obviously ahead, I guess the main things that I want to plug is the upcoming uh, lecture that I'll be doing at the Victorian Lodge of Research, um, which is going to be on my paper, Completing Our Allotted Task While It Is Yet Day. Um, and that will be happening on the 27th of April um, which will be at 7pm at the Ivelda Masonic Sem Temple, which is in Ivanhoe. Um, 
I don't know if there is a dining fee. I, if it is, I guess, budget for about $20. Um, from what I understand, it will be quite a big night. I've been going around and plugging it. And um, I guess uh, some of the stuff I've been doing on Wentz KMU, etc., has has spiked some interest. Um, I'm almost done. I will be releasing the paper publicly um, on that day. It's going to be It's quite long. I don't know if you can really call it a paper anymore. It'll probably end up being about 65 pages. Um, I've got even got someone writing a foreword for it, which, was, which is great. So... Uh, we'll be releasing that, and I'm looking forward to the opportunity to engage with our listeners about that, and hopefully we'll be doing some episodes dedicated to some of the content. So if you do want to get on the mailing list, uh, you can email me through uh, jack.aquilina at bluelouncesc.com or podcast at bluelouncesc.com, and um, I'll arrange you to be on the mailing list, and uh, I want to thank everyone for their support in advance. Other than that, um, David, we are obviously... The Blue Land Social Club is out and about visiting first degrees and um, we are looking at organising an executive retreat coming up in the next couple of weeks or within the next month to really set out some more events. But otherwise, it's uh, it's all quiet for us here. What about you, Dave? What's what's coming up Masonically? Yeah, there's uh, not too much for me. I'll, I'm hoping to be out and about a bit more, um, working with the New South Eastern Mornington Peninsula president um davos so hoping to catch up with him in the next week or two to see what we can do to really kick this area off uh we've got uh, obviously standard lodge meeting this month um we've also got i think it's uh, i think it's in this month the new virtual lodge um foundation meeting oh yes i forgot about um, that at the 9th of yep. april so if you want to get along april, to talk about a new uh, virtual lodge that's being set up here in victoria it's going to be very different to the Castle Island Virtual Lodge. I think it's. I think a better description would be a streamed lodge. Um, there's still going to be physical offices and the rest, and they'll be streaming the lodge to vi- to people who can't make it there physically, uh, which will be an interesting concept. So if you are interested in being in on that concept and uh, you are an overseas listener or you're interstate, um, you can jump on uh, virtually via the link that we post in the event page, and you can actually tune in and uh, be part of that inaugural founders meeting. We are accepting applications from overseas. The, um, the capitation is going to be worked out to be a discounted capitation. Um, it should cost somewhere in the, in the range of 50 bucks, I think it is, which is pretty cheap for our lodges in Victoria, considering the um, huge cost of capitation we pay per member. But either way, uh, if you are interested, 9th of April, it's about 7.30 p.m. Uh, Eastern Standard Time here in Australia. And um, we look forward to seeing you there. And I almost forgot, David, I, I guess one thing we should plug is the grand installation. I forgot all yep, about it. Yep, that, was, that um, was the next thing I was about to say. 7th of April, um, which is a Saturday, there'll be a joint grand installation. The Supreme Grand Chapter of Victoria will be installing uh, most eminent companion um, Hamer into the chair of first principal of the chapter. Um, and uh, that will be happening during the day. And then that evening, um, Right Worshipful Brother Keith Murray will be installed as Most Worshipful Grand Master of the United Grand Lodge of Ancient Free and Accepted Masons of Victoria. It's going to be at the Crown Palladium, which is um, a pretty uh, fancy place to hold it. I think there's over a 1,000 people going, um, and it's going to be a huge event, which is already booked out. So if you want to go, I'm sorry, and you haven't booked a ticket, bad luck. But... In saying that, um, we will, we don't will probably be releasing this episode after that date. So we'd like to congratulate most worshipful brother Keith on on his on his elevation. He's a big fan of the podcast and the show and and the club, and we look forward to working very closely with him over the next two years uh, to really um, see Freemasonry take on that positive and embrace that positive future, which is something we're all very excited about. So grand installation seventh of April. Make sure you consider it. Well, Jack. Um, we do believe it or not, we actually get quite a lot of your listenership listening to us. Uh, we're slowly trying to poach them all, but then again, I think you think you've poached more than us, to be honest with you, from Australia. So, uh, what's happening with you methodically? Maybe give us an idea of things we should we should look out for, just in case we happen to be in Lancaster or wherever you are. Uh, I'm I'm outside of Lancaster. I'm about. Uh... 16 miles northeast of Lancaster. Uh, Masonically, it's the regular grind. Uh, we have stated meetings, extra meetings. Um, we have a um, uh, table chapter coming up. That it, uh, it'll be similar to a cha- table lodge, but for the for the members of the chapter in the district. Um, that's coming up in June. Uh, in August, we're having an AMD council in gathering in um for eastern pennsylvania it'll be our i think it'll be our inaugural in gathering uh that'll be held at my lodge at Africa lodge uh, on august 11th um there is a limited number of tickets available and i think we're down to like 10 okay um 
So by the time this airs, it, it will most likely be sold out. But that'll that's a that's an exciting new venture for us. Um, as for me, I would just uh, tell all of your listeners to turn off uh, your podcast and turn <laughs> ours on, and come 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 and join the absurdity at Masonic Light L I T E. Well, it's and, it's basically uh, is our podcast. You got to spend more time talking about Jack on your podcast than just about anything else. Well, there is that. Yeah, and we do the same thing, I suppose. Talking about I'm start, <laughs> start picking on David, I guess a little bit. So. Yeah. <laughs> There's plenty to pick on. Like, trust me. Yeah, yeah it's, I'm gonna, it's, I want to talk for a minute about that headset, David. What, where? What is that? The great new headset thing that you got on there. That, it, it's it's my it's my starter kit for to become a Cyberman. Uh, yeah. I was going to say croquet. You can get right through the wicket right there. That's. I think he's trying to pick up signals from beyond, um, but it's, it's, not, it's, 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 it's not working. It's not working for a group, but, you know. But uh, it's, and I'm glad that I, one thing I've noticed in this episode, which um, Jason Lewis seems to struggle with a little bit, is we've had no accent issues, uh, which has been great. So um, congratulations oh, you know for understanding why? our accent. Why is that? No, I, I spent uh, I spent about six months watching Offspring on Netflix. Oh, okay. <laughs> so yeah. <laughs> So I got it. Yeah, it looked a lot like that, actually. Oh, there you go. So everyone, uh, Jason Lewis, a message to you: Watch Offspring, my friend. Uh, jump, Absolutely. jump across to Jack Harley's house. He'll he'll help you in educating you on. Australian I think you accents. need to watch The Castle to get the true Australian accent down. <laughs> ah, I haven't seen that. I'll yeah, look for it. that's a good that's a good movie. Um, but you know, look, uh, that, that's all I've got for news. And thank you, Jack, for sharing what's happening out of your area. And um, I guess that wraps up a fantastic episode of the Brought to Light Masonic Podcast. Like Jack said, please check out our good friends and what we would consider the closest relationship we have with any of the podcasts is masonic light we love them all um larry pete jack jason the entire team um there's odd people that they have doing segments here and there so listen to it it's great fun and it really does reflect the sort of conversations we have um you know after lodger at a blue lounge social club meeting and it's really genuine and passionate so please check it out um, we'll put the, sh- the link to the uh, the podcast in the show notes and um, if you do have any questions, you can forward them through. I'll forward them to me, and I'll forward them through to Jack and the team at the uh, Masonic Light Podcast, and that's at podcast at blueloungesc.com. dot um, This has been uh, one of the episodes of the Brought to Light Masonic Podcast. Uh, we've had an episode that's been discussing the future of Freemasonry, and also a discussion about the significance and symbolism of the Saints John in Freemasonry in the United States and why it isn't necessarily something that we discuss usually here with Jack Harley, who is the host of the Masonic Light Podcast. I'm your host, Brother Jack Akbalina. And I'm your host, Brother David Lingworth. And stay safe, stay on the level, and we'll speak to you in the next couple of weeks. You've been listening to the Brought to Light Masonic Podcast, bringing you to light through discussions and research papers about Australian Freemasonry and the Victorian jurisdiction in particular. We look forward to speaking to you on our next edition, and until then, we are happy to meet, sorry to part, and happy to meet again.